so welcome once again folks my name is Rok Saeed Kazmi you're watching my youtube channel and today I have brought some interesting cases for you basically there are two cases but they are very interesting and you would learn a lot from these two cases so without further ado let's dive in get started so the very first case is a 15 year old girl now this girl has got a history of uh, cuff and upper back pain which she says started two weeks ago so she says it started as an upper back pain and then she started having dry cuff now this cuff has been on and off but what she says is that has been progressively getting worse over these last two weeks now four days ago before this presentation she finally managed to saw her general practitioner who probably thought that she might be having a chest infection he gave her clarithromycin because she's got a history of being allergic to penicillin he started taking oral clarithromycin but she could only take two doses as she started vomiting after that and then since then she has been progressively becoming more and more unwell more ill she says she's becoming weak she's tired she's got no left energy left she's losing her appetite and possibly she has lost weight as well when specifically asked about if she had had fever in the last these two weeks she denies categorically she says she's been sometimes feeling warm but there is no documented evidence of fever now on examination she has got a respiratory rate of 28 per minute so she's a 15 year old so probably tachypnic sets are 92 percent on room air and they have been dropping intermittently to 88 percent now she's got a heart rate of 120 minutes was probably some to some extent there is tachycardia so the temperature at the moment of her examination was 35.9 that's not bad she's got slight paler to her skin as well now when you auscultate the chest it's clear to auscultation except that you feel like the 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 auscultation or the breath sounds are slightly reduced in the lower zones on both sides you also feel that there is a group of uh, firm painless mated lymph nodes on the left side of the neck so that is in the lower part of the um, anterior cervical triangle and there are probably two or three ill-defined group of lymph nodes which are mated together possibly and they are firm apart from that rest of the examination is absolutely negative now you start thinking what could be this because patient looks unwell has got a history of cuff and upper back pain has been progressively getting worse so what you find on examination is that the sets are dropping despite having a clear chest mostly and uh, the other thing is that she has got uh, a group of uh, lymph nodes so you think possibly with this given history there might be something in the chest there is probably a pathology sitting somewhere in the chest that is your first uh, um, suspicion so what you do is you do a chest x-ray and the chest x-ray is right in front of you so stop here for a moment look at the chest x-ray and see what do you find now let me consolidate the findings uh, for you guys now if you look at this chest x-ray you can see that there is a very visible pleural effusion on the right side how do you know it's pleural effusion because there is opacity and this opacity has got concavity towards the upper and you can see there is blunting of the right costal uh, phrenic angle as well so there is pleural effusion on the right side which is very evident to some extent there might be some pleural effusion on the left side as well because there is blunting of the left costal phrenic angle as well uh, you can't clearly see the diaphragms because they are obscured by these opacities heart border is also not very clear superiorly because what you can see that there is an opacity sitting on the superior border of the chair which uh, of the heart which is causing mediastinal widening so if you see this is the mass something an opacity which is basically causing widening of the mediastinum so mediastinum is very wide and the heart is somewhere over here but the borders are obscured especially the superior border is obscured so something which is probably uh, an opacity which is there in the superior mediastinum and again if you connect the dots bilateral pleural effusions some form of mediastinal widening and lymphadenopathy on the left side now what do you think at this point in time now many people would say just looking at the chest x-ray that it might be chest infection or pneumonia but see here two weeks history there is no fever i mean with somebody who lands up in pleural effusion because of pneumonia or pneumonic uh, paraneumonic effusions 
they should be having like quite spiking temperatures somewhere during these two weeks the other thing is it should be by and large mostly unilateral though obviously sometimes bilateral can also happen but in otherwise fit and healthy girl why should she develop both sided uh, pneumonia so uh, that goes against the you know the chest infection being the very first cause of her presentation lymphadenopathy a mass in the mediastinum and bilateral pleural effusion actually points towards a malignancy and when we talk about malignancies depending on what malignancies are common in different age groups here especially lymphadenopathy with a mediastinal mine as mass and superior mediastinal mass could be a thymic mass obviously thymus is not visible in children of this age we usually see them in children under less than one year of age but this presentation this could is probably a lymphoma this is probably a lymphoma so initially she was treated as chest infection i mean you know there was a caveat here and probably the doctor thought that um, she might be having chest infections it started on antibiotics but what happened within 24 hours another chest x-ray was done because she didn't improve and now you can see that the pleural effusion has aggravated you can see more on the left side as well on the right side is aggravated and you can still see the mediastinum mass and the heart border you cannot make anything of the uh, cardiac silhouette so there is a mediastinal mass uh, she is not responding to antibiotics whatever antibiotics she is getting now and she is worsening so that goes further in favor of a neoplastic process so this is most probably lymphoma now as far as her investigation is done so if you look at the investigations so she has got an increase in the platelet count and she has got increase in the urea which probably means she's a bit um what you call dehydrated uh quack uh, what you call profile is slightly deering the high sense crp is not that bad so again that is probably going against a bacterial infection some more tests are done and if you see here you can see a very high ldh levels very high ldh levels and a very high uric acid level so somebody who is doing poorly has got high LDH. Now, LDH is a non specific test, but it's usually raised in neoplastic conditions. And the other thing that is making it more suspicious is uric acid. Why would a 15 year old who hasn't got gout all, all, all of a sudden have raised uric acid level? That's probably coming from increased cell turnover. So, this goes very much in favor of malignancy so most probably we are dealing here with lymphomas so coming down to what are lymphomas basically lymphomas are neoplastic proliferation of the lymphoid tissue outside of blood in solid organs remember your white blood cells uh, basically which are generated in the lymphoid tissue they can develop neoplastic transformation inside the blood and when that happens inside the blood we call it as leukemias but the same white blood cell you know when they actually are uh, undergoing neoplastic transformation outside of the blood not in the blood but outside of the blood that are means solid organs that could be lymphoid tissue that could be spleen that could be um, um, liver that is known as what lymphoma so lymphomas and leukemias are very much related with one another the only one thing is whether the proliferation is inside the blood if it is inside the blood we call it leukemias if it is inside the solid organs like lymphoid liver and spleen we call it as lymphomas but remember there can be overlap as well lymphomas can have leukemic transformations and leukemias can have lymphoma transformations now there are two types of lymphomas coming down to that hodgkins and non-hodgkins now Hodgkin's basically is you see both are lymphomas but like they behave the same way despite some differences but the issue here is that in Hodgkin lymphoma the classical uh, characteristic is presence of a special type of cell which is known as a reed sternberg cell so reed sternberg cell basically is also known as the owl appearance so there is a cell which has got like a bilobed nuclei and it looks like the uh, face the eyes of an owl so that's why it is known as owl eyed appearance of the white blood cells which are known as reed sternberg cells so uh, these uh, cells are hallmark of hodgkin lymphoma and then uh, if you um, further subdivide them there are four types so there could be lymphocyte predominant lymphocyte depletion uh, mixed cellularity or nodular sclerosing obviously nodular sclerosing and uh, uh, 
uh, has got the worst um, what you call prognosis so there are four different subtypes how do we know that we have to take biopsy of the lymph node so clinically it's very difficult to say it's hodgkin or non-hodgkin we have to do we have to go down at the cellular level but there are certain characteristics by which we can tell whether this is hodgkin or non-hodgkin because hodgkin usually um, you know sort of when it the lymphoid tissue is involved usually the surrounding lymphoid tissue is involved it's very rare that it would cause pathology in one area and then in a distant area while non-hodgkins can have like non uh, what you call contagious like not not no, what you call the areas which are you know far away from one another they can be affected simultaneously like you can have a group of lymph nodes in the in the in the let's say in the neck and then you can have liver or spleen involvement while mostly you will see that in Hodgkin lymphoma, the you know the the lymph nodes which are close to one another, they are involved. In non-Hodgkin's, it's the other way around. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma has got many subtypes. I don't know to need to go into the detail of that. Nobody can remember that. They're so much like complex. Uh, but remember, they are basically classified into whether they are B cell or T cell. You know, your white blood cells are divided into B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. It depends whether they are coming from the B cell lineage or from the T cell lineage. So your non-Hodgkin lymphomas would be B cell lymphomas and T cell lymphomas. And within those B cell and T lymphoma, T cell uh, lineages, they can be further uh, subclassified whether they basically are consisting of uh, predominantly premature cells which are known also known as a precursor cell or whether they are composed of mature cells so whether they are composed of premature uh, b lymphocytes or t lymphocytes or whether they are composed of mature b lymphocytes or t lymphocytes so they can be precursor b cell lymphomas precursor t cell lymphomas and mature b cell lymphomas and mature t cell lymphomas and there are then further sub varieties as well burkitt lymphomas and so on and so forth so uh basically how do we know which one is which is we have to do immunohistochemistry and cytogenetics that's why all the lymphoma diagnosis have to undergo cytogenetics and immunohistochemistry because immunohistochemistry tells you uh, whether this is cd19 cd20 which class and subclass of b and t lymphocytes are affected and cytogenetics would give you whether there are any what you call oncogenes or translocations of the gene associated with some of the lymphomas which can occur like for example in burkitt lymphoma you can have the translocation between 18 and 8 and 14 chromosomes so depending you know again different uh, types subtypes of lymphomas can different types of um, you know genetics involved with that so immunohistochemistry and cytogenetics these are very very important when we have to deal with either lymphoma either hodgkin lymphoma or non-hodgkin lymphoma further moving on once you know or you're suspecting that it is lymphoma based on the clinical history then we need to do ct ct is done for staging of the tumors and staging of the tumor is basically done on an arbor classification which is four stages stage one stage two stage three and stage four so stage one is when there is a single group of lymph nodes involved on either side of the diaphragm above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm if there are two groups involved on either side of the diaphragm either above or below two groups of lymph nodes then it is the uh, stage two if there are group of lymph nodes involved one or more than one involved on either side of the diaphragm then we call it stage three and stage four it disseminated where it has spread everywhere so depending obviously prognosis for stage four is always poor it would always be better for stage one so that is known as n arbor classification depending on where the uh, group of lymph nodes that are involved they are found so for that we need ct uh, of the chest and pelvis and abdomen you know and sometimes we can do the pet scans as well because that can actually tell us if there are any hidden areas which are normally not picked up by the cts now how do we diagnose we can suspect but we need excision biopsy and why i'm saying excision biopsy because you need to know the whole lymph node architecture so for that you need to have a full excision biopsy i know some people do they find needle aspiration cytology but fine needle aspiration cytology does not give you the whole picture you need a full biopsy of the lymph node so that should be the preferred mode of investigating whenever it is possible so once we have got that thing we also do the immunohistochemistry and cytogenetics on the samples that we have taken because i told you earlier it helps in subclassification whether they are the b cell and the t cells and which lineage is further of the b and the t cells involved and it also helps in prognosis because certain types of lymphomas have got 
worse prognosis certain have got better prognosis so in order to explain the prognosis to the patient it's very very important that you do the immunohistochemistry and cytogenetics Bef without that it would be incomplete diagnosis of uh, lymphomas bone bi biopsy it's not done routinely it can be done when you think that there is some form of transformation the lymphoma is spilling into the blood and becoming leukemia and vice versa so whenever we think that it's going in the blood then it's a good idea to examine the bone marrow as well to see what is the level of bone marrow involvement apart from the routine investigation that we would do like a full blood count see so une's liver function test renal function test to see how the other organs are doing whether they are compromised or not it's very very important to some of the um, you know non-specific marker that give you an idea that there is a tumor involved and that is ldh which stands for serum lactate dehydrogenase uric acid levels and phosphate levels because if they are raised that gives you an idea that probably this patient has got a, a predisposition to develop tumor lysis syndrome because they've got a high cell turnover and if you suddenly start them with chemotherapy or radiotherapy all of a sudden many cells would die and they can go into pure renal failure and can have metabolic uh, complications because of that so they need to be well hydrated before you start them on any type of anti-cancerous therapy so ldh uric acid and phosphate must be done and as you see in the case that i described the ldh was very high it was more than 2000 i think normally should be less than 300 350 something uric acid was also very high so that was going more in favor of what a neoplastic process lymphoma in this particular case as compared to a just infection treatment now as far as treatment is concerned uh, we number one we can use uh, surgery we can use chemotherapy we can use radiotherapy usually radiotherapy is done to reduce the bulk of the tumor and usually the um, you know um, the dose is 5 to 15 geese and uh, that can be given for example if there is a large mediastinal mass like in this uh, girl which is probably causing her dyspnea and a lot of this will be, it needs some form of radiation to shrink the size of the tumor so we can then have induction radiotherapy to shrink the size of the tumor so radiotherapy is used as an adjunct then the uh, hallmark of the um, treatment is um, chemotherapy so we use different types of uh, you know regimens abvd or vamp for hodgkin lymphomas abvd is like the time tested uh, therapy adriomycin uh, bleomycin vincristine and uh, dacarbazine and downorubicin or vamp vamp has got like a little uh, like this the side effects profile is slightly less so it's more preferred uh, for children as compared to adults but why we use all these three four medications because they have got non-overlapping profile of side effects it's like like adriomycin have a different side effect profile as compared to bleomycin because sometimes the medications can have overlapping profile which leads to a lot of toxicity and nasty side effects so if you've got different side effects for different you can combine these medications together to have better you know targeting the tumor cells and have better outcome so uh, usually two to four cycles of abvd or vamp for hodgkin lymphoma can be given it varies from center to center and from uh, you know uh, patient to patient those patients where there are uh, what you call they don't go into remission or there are relapses then they can have autologous or allogenic hemopoietic stem, stem cell transplantation which can give them hope it's not like 100 percent uh curative but like 60 70 percent success rate for those cases which have failed on chemotherapy for non-hodgkin lymphoma it's usually the chop therapy again um, uh you know three four medications anti-cancer struck with like overlapping uh, non-overlapping side effects profile usually two cycles are given and then the patient is reassessed whether they to see whether they've got in remission or not so again those who have failed they can have then uh, autologous or allogenic uh, hemopoietic stem cells transplantation but these are very very specialized um, what you call modalities and only done in a few centers around the world then apart from the treatment that you give them specifically for killing the cancer cells they need some adjunct treatment as well because they might be having infections down the line so you need to treat them with antibiotics you have to prevent the tumor lysis syndrome so you make sure that they are well hydrated and uh, you know you, you deal with increasing uric acid levels or whatever and then you have to improve their nutrition as well because usually with the, the side effects of chemotherapy is something they might start losing weight they might become ketchup so it's very important that they've got like uh, high uh, calorie formulas or something like that so that they maintain their 
nutrition. So this was all about like um, lymphomas and an interesting case presentation uh, in which we have uh, briefly discussed the lymphomas, its types, diagnosis and treatment. Now moving on to the next interesting case and this is a 12 year old boy. He comes as an ENT expected. Why? Because he basically had a tonsillectomy to, done two, three days ago and he was otherwise doing well but now he has developed a bit of red eyes and rash on his neck and he still is having some pain in the throat. So he's brought because they think that it might be related to his tonsillectomy. So it's better to have a sort of a review by the ENT surgeons to see how they're going or there might be some infection uh, at the uh, site of the operation. So he needs a review. But apart from that, he's got a little bit of abdominal pain and some loose tools as well. Now, while waiting for the ENT surgeons to come down and have a look at him, He's flagged by the triage nurses because he looks a bit unwell. I mean, his heart rate is a bit like uh, up. His respiratory rate is also up. So they have flagged it to the emergency doctor so to assess him. And you are the, let's say, the pediatric emergency medicine doctor or you are the pediatrician who has to look into this. Case. So it looks like probably a straightforward case, like probably had tonsillectomy and was probably developed some infection at the site of um, his operation. And because of that, he's having uh, some problems. Anyhow, so when you assess him, you find these signs. So he has got, uh, you can see that he has got red eyes. He's got like probably non-exudative uh, conjectivitis. And he has got this rash. You can see this sort of a uh, papillosquamous rash. And there's a bit of slight like drying of the skin around his mouth as well. And apart from that, uh, what you see is that he has got a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius. His heart rate is 135. So it's tachy. he's tachycardic because he's 12 years old. Like this is a bit high for a 12 year old. Respiratory rate is 26 per minute. He's shaking. He's, he's febrile. He's shaking. So I think probably he's having rigors because the temperature has acutely gone up. You um, examine his throat. You examine his um, systems. You find that he has got healing tonsillar fossa. Like you, you examine his throat and you can see that there is no like dead slough over there. There are no... Um, what you call islands of pus over there or bleeding from the tonsillar um, pillars of the tonsillar fossa. The rest of the examination is unremarkable. His chest is clear. His abdomen is soft. No uh, joint swelling pains and things. I told you earlier, I've shown you the pictures. He's got micropapular rash on neck and slightly on the face as well. So what do you think he's got? Now, obviously, the caveat here is that because of this previous surgery done two days ago it probably looks like that he has got an infection of uh, the area where the operation was done and probably is you know is uh, developing all these things because of that but basically something else so this is basically what we call as toxic shock syndrome toxic shock syndrome now we say how toxic shock syndrome now, toxic shock syndrome, basically, let me go through what toxic shock syndrome and I will come back to this point later on. It's basically a toxin mediated illness. So there are toxins which are released by gram positive uh, bacteria, staphylococci as well as uh, streptococci. So staphylococci and streptococci, they have got this ability that they can uh, secrete a toxin, which is basically an exotoxin. What this toxin does is this acts as a super antigen. Super antigen means normal antigen are picked up by your T lymphocytes and they are presented to the uh, class 2, you know, MHC uh, receptor containing cells, which we call as antigen presentation. And then that those cells, they become activated and they you know, invite other uh, white blood cells into that area to fight that bacteria off. But sometimes what happens, these toxins, they act as a super antigen. Super antigen means that what they do is when they attach to the uh, T lymphocytes and when these lymphocytes present this antigen to the uh, class 2 MHC cells, what happens? It just kicks them to produce more and more and more of cytokines and local mediators, which causes a storm of different chemicals and activation of uh, the um, inflammatory cascades which leads to a mayhem in that particular area so that super antigen would lead to a massive release of cytokines and would cause all these manifestation which is seen with uh, toxic shock syndrome so there would be vasodilatation there would be capillary leak and uh, organ multi-organ failure 
so remember these are exotoxins this is not caused by the bacteria themselves this is basically the toxin released by the bacteria so sometimes the bacteria might not be there in the blood it's just the toxins which is causing this problem remember it's not the bacteria it's the toxin especially staphylococcal toxins so there is a criteria to uh, diagnose uh, this toxic shock syndrome so if somebody has got a fever of more than 38 and this is a clinical criteria like you know 38 to 0.9 or more it's got hypotension so hypotension means obviously the uh, blood pressure is going down and blood pressure for kids it simply means less than the fifth centile for their age group or in adults it should be less than 90 degrees systolic they've got a diffuse macular erythroderma so they have got a sunburn like skin remember some people think there should be peeling of the skin remember the peeling of the skin is not a criteria because you hear if you think about peeling of the skin you basically are confusing toxic toxic shock syndrome with staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome both are different staphylococcal scalded syndrome skin that would basically cause bullet and you know layers of skin to come off in sheets nikolsky sign positive a little bit of pressure and you know the skin comes off that happens in staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome that is different this is staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome so the rash would not be blister but would be rather more of a macular redness just like you see in sunburn so it's more like a sunburn rash later on after one or two weeks it can have desquamation and uh, it can itch as well and more than three organs should be involved so the chest is usually involved uh, GIT can be involved joints can be involved uh, neurological system can be involved like at least it should be three organs uh, or system should be uh, affected most of the time it's liver lungs and kidneys are usually affected then there's a lab criteria as well lab criteria says that there should be cultures should be negative for other passages you take blood cultures but that should be negative for others see it is not saying for staphylococcal it's saying negative for others so whether you get staphylococcal or not doesn't matter but it should be negative for others though it shouldn't be growing e coli it shouldn't be growing pseudomonas it should be growing anything else whether staph is there or not that is not the case but there shouldn't be any other uh, organism which is cultured and if you are doing serology for certain types of infection serology should also be negative for example serology may be let's say for mycoplasma or let's say for uh, enteric fever whatever that should also be negative so clinical criteria and lab criteria if that is present that is how we diagnose toxic shock syndrome but it's quite evidence because it is basically a toxin mediated shock so hypotension usually you know two three system are involved because uh, let's say he's got diarrhea so liver uh, let's say the the GIT is also involved he might have raised liver enzymes so that simply means liver is involved there might be a deranged renal function that simply means uh, kidneys are involved so clinical criteria and lab criteria actually is used for diagnosis of toxic shock syndrome which could be staphylococcal as well as streptococcal now what are the differential diagnosis what other things could present with the same thing septic shock now obviously septic shock could be because of sepsis but remember sepsis usually does not classically present with rash so if it is rash you think more of toxic shock syndrome rather than sepsis which can be caused by any organism in usa rocky mountain spotted fever can also um, in uk it's not um, a big problem it's not an issue so i will just skip this one sometimes this could be a drug reaction as well so after tonsillectomy maybe he's taking antibiotics maybe he's taking some um, medication which has caused drug reaction so that does reaction can present in the form of steven johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis but usually what happens in these cases there is mucosal involvement there would be involvement of the mucosa like oral cavity eyes in toxic shock syndrome there is no oral involvement there is no mucosal involvement keep this in mind no mucosal involvement no mucosal involvement again no mucosal involvement mucosal involvement think of what steven johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis then meningococcemia can also present but meningococcemia would be presenting with like more of uh, uh, petechial rashes bruising maybe meningeal signs things like that and kawasaki disease which is basically a vasculitis but it presents it's got the clinical criteria so they present with the strawberry tongue and um, maybe some peeling of the digits you know rather than and they've got a polymorphous rash and cervical adenopathy as well so these are a few things that uh, you know are kept in the differentials and that might confuse you 
But remember, somebody who is having hypertension, is having diarrhea and a sunburn-like rash. Sunburn-like rash. Remember, in Kawasaki, it's more of a polymorphous rash. If it's more of a sunburn-like rash, think of toxic shock syndrome. Treatment. Treatment. The preferred drug is clindamycin. They say clindamycin is not only like it's an antibody, but it's also very effective against the exotoxin. So the uh, exotoxins produced by staphylococci or streptococci, it is very, very effective against that. So IV clindamycin is the drug of choice. Sometimes if we are suspecting MRSA, methylazine uh, uh, resistant staphylococcus aureus, in that particular case, then you have to give either vancomycin or linozylate. So if your blood cultures are positive or that child has been carrier of MRSA, so if it is MRSA, then you have to give vancomycin or linozylate. Clindamycin, if uh, you know you obviously as i told you that this is very much effective against that exotoxins which is causing that because more than bacteria we are interested in the exotoxin circulating exotoxin that needs to be neutralized it can also be neutralized by intravenous immunoglobulin so ivig in a dose of one gram per kg can also be given so specific immunoglobulin to neutralize this exotoxin that can also be given along with steroids to help in controlling the inflammation. If you are suspecting streptococci, and remember for streptococci, you should be, the blood culture should be positive for group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Remember the presence of uh, or culture of uh, Staphylococcus aureus is not required for diagnosis of Staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome. But for streptococci, you need to have a culture positive for group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Remember, so again, blood uh, positive step aureus is not a requirement, but positive strep is a requirement for streptococcal related toxic shock syndrome. And if that's the case, benzyl penicillin is also or can be given. So remember, again, this is very important that group A beta hemolytic streptococci culture. Uh, positivity is very important for diagnosing streptococcal related toxic shock syndrome but isolation of staph is not necessary for the diagnosis of staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome so uh, my friends this was all about uh, lymphomas and toxic shock syndrome with the help of two cases which would help you in consolidating your knowledge relating to these two diseases if you still have got any questions related to these two uh, entities put your comment uh, put your questions down in the comment section below and i would be more than happy to answer whatever your queries are so have a very good day take care of yourself bye bye